Good morning, Christ City. My name is Andrea. I'm one of the pastors here. Well, good morning. Um, I have not said this recently like I did at the beginning of the pandemic, but I want to say it again. Church, I miss you. I wish we were together this morning. I miss the minor cafeteria. I miss its sticky blue chairs. I miss hearing your voices and seeing your faces and hugging you. And this has been such a disorienting season, and I feel lost without you in a lot of ways. And I promise this isn't just a planned statement to get you to talk in the online chats. It's really not. You can do that. Um, I have just sincerely missed you as I've prepared to preach this week. Certain faces have just popped up in my mind, and I'm just longing to be together. And I know that's close, and we're on the other side. I think of being apart, but I just, I just wanted to confess that that's where I've been this week and certainly where I am this morning and all up in my feels. Um, that's where we are. We are in a series called Be Free, and we're walking through the book of Galatians, which is one of the Apostle Paul's earlier letters to this brand new church. Paul writes this letter because it's come to his attention that in his absence, some other teachers have come into the newly formed community, and they've begun to try and persuade the Galatians away from the uncertainty in this new movement of the Spirit and back towards the false security of good works and trying to obey the religious law perfectly in order to be in God's presence and that is threatening their freedom. So in this chapter, in chapter 5, which we're looking at today, Paul sets out to remind them of their freedom in Christ. Now our anchor verse for this series, you have heard every week, the anchor verse for this series is Galatians 5, 1. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Real freedom, the kind that is a gift given by God, is Paul's focus in this whole letter. And the Galatians are trying to figure out what it means to live into their identity as part of God's family, and it seems it's difficult for them to let go of this tendency to like earn that identity. And Paul's urging them to stop binding themselves up with trying to do that. The series graphic uh, for this particular uh, series that we're in is a bird in a cage with an open door. And Paul is exhorting the Galatians church to see the open cage door, to get out of the cage and stop flying back in it under the guise that the cage is freedom. Their identity as God's children does not hinge on their earning it, but on what God has done and they're no longer bound. Throughout the letter, Paul lays out this argument for freedom, specifically from the confines of salvation through the law. So last week, Justin walked us through Paul's emphasis on freedom and the family of God. This is chapter 4, verse 7. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. As children of God, freedom is already available. Walking in that freedom or submitting to a yoke of slavery is a choice, and sometimes it can be tricky to tell the difference. Now, as we dig into chapter 5 of Galatians today, you're going to notice that the letter takes a little bit of a turn. Paul's arguments are about to get a little bit more practical. So far, Paul's arguments have been a bit more abstract, but in this chapter, he turns to what freedom in Christ looks like in real time. And I'm eager to get into small groups um, since they've started again and talk about the implications here for us too. So again, today we're looking at chapter 5. We're looking at verses 2 through 15, immediately picking up after Paul has firmly admonished the Galatians to stand firm and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Now, if you're like me, and at some point in your life you thought yoke was yolk, like an egg, I thought maybe it might be helpful to see an example of a yoke. This is a yoke. Um, it's going to be a yoke. So a yoke is a heavy wooden harness that fits over the shoulders of two work animals, like oxen, and it's used to attach them neck to neck and hitch them up to a plow that they're to pull across the field to prepare it for planting a crop. And a yoke was meant to bind the working animal to the weighted burden they were meant to pull. So to be in a yoke is to be bound by something and to be burdened by it. In our passage today, Paul names three yokes that can be put on, three specific ways to be bound. So the first one is familiar to us. He's talked about it previously in the letter. We can be bound to the law. 
A few weeks ago, Watson unpacked what's contextually meant here when Paul refers to the law. And as a reminder, Watson pointed out that when you hear or read the word law in Galatians, you can think of the Ten Commandments, you can think of the laws given in the books of Deuteronomy, Leviticus, simple list of laws, and the big complex ones. The law is the culmination of all the things required of Israel to live in a manner pleasing to God. Now, Paul has talked a lot about the law in this letter to Galatians, particularly as a barrier to freedom. In chapter 2, he writes, We know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we've come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by doing the works of the law because no one will be justified by the works of the law. And then in chapter 3, he writes, If a law had been given that would make alive, then righteousness would indeed come through the law. But the scripture has imprisoned all things under the power of sin, so that what was promised through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. The law is not what leads to freedom, but it's instead a yoke to be bound to. In today's text in chapter 5, Paul gets very specific about which part of the law the Galatians are struggling with, which is the ritual of circumcision. Now, for us, it might feel like a stretch to understand why someone might struggle with the desire to be circumcised as an adult, which is fair. Um, And that point of tension and that question is a good place, I think, just for us to be reminded that scripture isn't just like plug and play. (laughs) It comes with its own context, And when we read it, we come with our own context. And when those things meet, like here, where it's hard to imagine a good reason why someone might want to become circumcised, it's right to name the point of tension and to dig into it, to explore both sides of the context that are being brought. So we're going to do that. The ritual of circumcision was a part of the law, and it served as a physical signifier that someone was part of the nation of Israel and in covenant with God. One of the goals of law observance, including circumcision, was to be distinct. It was a mark that proved an identity as one within the family of God, and it marked clearly who was in and who was out. Now, those who were non-Jewish, also called Gentiles, could in certain circumstances become circumcised and be included sometimes. I think it's important to remember that the cluster of churches in Galatia that Paul's writing to in this letter is primarily made up of Gentile Christians. So as you might remember from earlier in the letter, there's a group of teachers who have come in and they're trying to influence and persuade the Galatian Christians that the law somehow guaranteed their connection to God as heirs, as God's children. And Paul gets more specific about this in chapter 5, verse 7, when he writes, You were running well. Who prevented you from obeying the truth? Such persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough. Whoever it is that's confusing you will pay the penalty. Requiring Gentile Christians like the Galatians to adhere to the law in order to legitimize their standing with God was, like one commentary put it, that I read this week, it was like building an unnecessary fence around the gospel. Or as we've talked about in this series, it was the gospel plus. Now, I think it's important to recognize that Paul's emphasis on faith and the gospel is not this like flat out complete rejection of the law as bad. The law has value when understood appropriately. The law's ultimate goal was to point towards and be a guide in the way of loving neighbor of pursuing shalom, but the law was not complete and could not achieve the freedom offered in Jesus. It can only just point towards it. And the law becomes detrimental when it's seen as the ultimate end. And in that case, the law tries to work its way to freedom through earning, and it becomes a yoke that binds us to our own efforts, our own strength to earn our freedom. And that's what Paul is warning against here in verses 2 through 6. When he says, listen, I, Paul, am telling you that if you let yourself be circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you. 
Once again, I testify to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obliged to obey the entire law. You who want to be justified by the law have cut yourselves off from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. The only thing that counts is faith working through love. Paul is not pitting the circumcised Christian against the uncircumcised Christian here, but making it clear that the matter of circumcision is secondary. It's not the ultimate thing. And he's saying that not only does the law no longer justify a person in good works, it actually now acts as a yoke, a chain, something that binds up. And that's the very opposite of what it means to be free. What is central, he writes, is faith expressed concretely through love of God and neighbor. And to centralize the law then is to be bound to it. And to be bound to the law is to not walk in the freedom offered by God. Being bound to the law. The second thing that Paul writes that we can be bound to is self. In verse 13, for you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence. Mm -hmm. So the Greek word translated here as self-indulgence is one that we've seen before. We've talked about it before. It's sarx. And sarx is translated into English a few different ways, uh, including sinful nature, self-indulgence, and most commonly you'll see it in English as flesh. We've talked about this before. But I just want to remind us that while sarx is translated as flesh in many translations, Paul is not saying that our bodies are bad or that flesh being opposed to spirit means our bodies and our hearts are bad and we're best to rid ourselves of them as quickly as possible, whether that's by pursuing a disembodied spirituality or by condemning our own bodies as obstacles on the path to God. That's not what that means. The translation here in our passage this morning is self-indulgence. Self-indulgence has the ability to bind us. It convinces us that we're playing in a zero-sum game and that it's necessary to devour others in order to feed ourselves. It falsely affirms that we have what it takes to be free completely within ourselves, which we do not. The freedom we experience in Christ and through the Spirit frees us from ourselves, from the very worst of self. And we're free from living in such a way that we mistake self-love for self-indulgence. We're free from living with a scarcity mindset in which we think of ourselves first out of fear. And we're free from having to operate in the currency of power in which we push others down to get ahead, or even worse, that we push others down because we think it angles us into a closer position to God. We're free from producing fruits of self-indulgence of sarks. Lisa's gonna walk through us through us through, Lisa's gonna walk us through the fruits of self-indulgence next week. And instead, we can cultivate the contrasting fruit of the spirit. Self-indulgence binds us and it keeps us from the freedom God promises. So we can be bound to the law. We can be bound to self. And Paul is clear that submitting to either of those yokes is not walking in God's freedom. But the last yoke in this section of the letter is surprisingly one he actually implores the Galatians to take on. This is verse 13. For you are called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Become slaves to one another. Bind yourself to the love of neighbor. This is the aim of the law. This is what freedom binds us to. Freedom in Christ doesn't mean freedom from all yokes. It just means freedom from the ones that do not lead to life. And I'm reminded of Jesus' Jesus's invitation in Matthew 11. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Mm 
The yoke of Christ binds us to one another. We are heirs together in the kingdom and we walk in freedom from exclusive inward looking restrictions and standards we'll never be able to meet. And instead we are free to seek out those we can serve in love. And this is one of the key differences between freedom and Christ and the idea of freedom that we know culturally as Americans really specifically. The concept of freedom has been co-opted in a lot of ways. Now, in Christ, we no longer fear that we won't get something, but that our neighbor won't. As much as we want health and wholeness for ourselves, we want it for one another. In the freedom that Christ gives, we allow ourselves to be bound to one another. We steward ourselves for one another. If any bird is still in a cage, we are not yet free. Any imprisonment, any way in which our neighbor is bound is not freedom, whether it's physical binds like poverty, oppression, access to resources, literal imprisonment, or if it's emotional or mental binds or spiritual captivity like disembodied faith, like nationalism, like legalism, like idolatry. To walk in the freedom of God is to be bound to one another in love and be deeply invested in each other's freedom too. So back in March, when eight people were killed in the Atlanta spa shooting, six of those being Asian women. I really struggled with how to process my feelings. Most of them were very brand new um, and all of them were very confusing and very heavy. And I just, I remember walking through the day, like in a daze, I was very numb. I was super glued to my phone and my laptop, just trying to get more information. I was reading the way that other Asian Americans were processing on the internet, which just, added to my emotional chaos inside and it felt like being trapped and the people who came for me were the black women from this community they emailed me they texted me they called me they sent me messages of solidarity and care and i knew without them saying so that it was because they were stewarding their own experiences for me they were shooting their own work, their own struggle to be free in order that I might walk in freedom with them too. To walk in the freedom of God is to be bound to one another in love and be deeply invested in each other's freedom too. One commentary I read this week explained this really well. If, if we're bound to the law, we're focused on keeping the commandments in order to establish our own merit. To serve our neighbor out of obligation to the law is still to do it for ourselves. If we're bound to self, we serve others in order to fulfill our own desires. And being bound to either of these causes us to use people to meet our goals rather than to serve them in love. Only when we are free from slavery, from being bound to the law and to sarks, to the flesh, to self-indulgence, will we be free to serve one another in love. To be bound to one another and not to self or to law is to let go of control, to resist our tendency to choose what's predictable and to avoid deference. And this adds a whole nother layer to Paul's anger towards those who are bringing false teaching into these Galatian communities. Their efforts and persuasions do not come from God, but from a desire to manipulate and wield power. In verse 12, Paul does not hold back. He has some choice words. He declares that they should go ahead and castrate themselves. He's mad, like big mad. But in saying this, Paul is expressing his desire that, his, that this group lose their power and their ability to dominate or manipulate the Galatians. They are a direct threat to the freedom of the Galatians. Walking in the freedom of God is not just like a given. And our freedom, church, is worked out, it's lived out together. Justin reminded us of this last week, too. This letter is written to the church, and this sermon is preached to the church, too. And I think that's part of why I've been missing you so much this week. As I prepared to preach, I was remembering the last time I preached on this section of Galatians a couple of years ago in a series that we did on the power and possibility of the Spirit. And I was listening to part of that sermon recording from our podcast this week. And I just, I can hear Marissa like amening. I can hear Charmaine laughing. I can hear you all adjusting yourselves in your chairs. And it made me sad. And it made the sermon harder 
And I'll confess to you that this series has been hard to preach. I don't know how you are. I don't know where you're at. I'm reminded each week that Paul is writing to a church and I feel without mine in part. What is the spirit calling us to? What does service and love to one another look like? What does it mean for us to walk in freedom, to stand firm and resist the yokes of slavery? I pose these questions to you this morning, church. This is the work that we do together. What are the yokes that seem easy but weigh us down? What are the laws that beckon us towards self-sufficiency? Where do you feel the pull towards self? What does it mean to be bound to one another? And therefore, what does it mean to be free? To close this morning, I want to read a section from the sermon I preached in 2019 when we were together in the cafeteria. And this section was encouraging to me. These words were compelling to me as I sort through these questions um, and wonder what the Spirit has for us as we seek to be unbound and walk in freedom in this still very uncertain season as the church. So this is from 2019. We stand in the freedom of the Spirit right now, and we also say that I remain confident that I will see the goodness of the Lord in my life, in my relationships, in how others interact in our city and the world. We have freedom to hope. We're not bound to discouragement and anger or vapid relationships or or fear. We're free from those. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Those chains have already been broken. We're not less free now than we will be. We are free now. And it's not just for ourselves. It's for one another, and it's for our neighborhood, and it's for our city, and it's for all those we're called to beckon into the spirit, life, and movement, into freedom. Church, let us not be bound to anything but freedom. Let's be free.